Hi everyone, welcome to our event. This event is brought to you by Data Talks Club, which is a community of people who love data. We have weekly events. Today is one of such events. And if you want to find out more about the events we have, there is a link in the description. Go there, click on this link, and you will see all the events we have in our pipeline. Do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You will not miss events like the one today. Uh, we have a lot of awesome events, as I mentioned. So do subscribe to our YouTube channel too. And last but not least, we have an amazing Slack community. If you're not there, you're missing out. So go there, sign up, and you will get to speak with other data enthusiasts. During today's interview, you can ask any question you want. There is a pinned link in the live chat. Click on this link, ask your question, and we will be covering these questions during the interview. Okay, that's all for the intro. Now let me figure out how to do it. I will open the questions we prepared for you. Okay, are you ready? Yes, let's do it. Okay, I am almost ready too. Okay, now I am. Um, so let's start. This week we'll talk about biohacking and improving productivity. Uh, by the way, do I say biohacking or biohacking? What's the right way of pronouncing it? I think it's biohacking. Biohacking, okay. So let me do another, <laughs> another uh, attempt. This week we'll talk about biohacking and improving productivity. We have a special guest today, Ruslan. Ruslan is a data scientist who lives in Berlin. He has tried a lot of healthy and not so healthy things to stay focused and productive. Eventually, he found a bunch of techniques, uh, protocols, concepts about our brain, body, and mind that might be helpful to others in the data community. And today, we will talk about all these things that he discovered. Uh, by the way, Ruslan is looking for a job. So if you need an awesome data scientist to join your team, uh, your team you can find him on LinkedIn. I also will add his contact details in the show notes. So welcome to the show, Ruslan. Thank you so much. It's I'm very excited to be here. Yeah. I'm very excited to have you here today, too. The questions for today's interview were prepared by Johanna Bayer. Thanks, Johanna, as always, for your help. And before we go into our main topic of biohacking, uh, let's start with your background. Can you tell us about your career journey so far? Yeah, sure. Um, so after the high school, I went to study international business management. And then I moved to Berlin and finished my bachelor in, in, in this field and did marketing. And I worked in several SaaS companies afterwards related to marketing. Um, and it was more like a, a business side of things. So I was talking to clients and I was just very bored. And then um, I realized that I want to do something more exciting for me. And I went for my master's. And in my master's, I studied business intelligence and process management. And I did some data science projects. And I completely fell in love with the topic. So after these projects, I realized I want to pursue a career in data science and uh, deal with machine learning models, help business make data-driven decisions and make the world a little bit better through this. And uh, that's how I got into data science. I landed uh, first an internship at OLX, uh, and then I have been working there as well as a data scientist. And I also did my master thesis about deep learning. So. It's a topic very dear to my heart, uh, as much as productivity and all the stuff I'm going to talk about. So, mm. yes. And when did you discover this topic of biohacking and productivity? Was it during your bachelor uh, degree years or later or when you already were into data science? Uh, actually, I've been interested in that for a long time. Uh, I just didn't know that it's called data science, oh, sorry, biohacking <laughs> until recently, but I was always uh, researching about some productivity tips or mental models and frameworks, how you can organize your time. Because I was one of those students who didn't study much during the actual normal study times. And then I would write the papers before the deadline and prepare on the last day for the exam. And I was always like thinking... every one of us. Yeah, like so many. <laughs> Most people, I mean, at least. <laughs> yeah. And I thought to myself after another de deadline that oh, I wish next time I would actually properly prepare. And then I thought, how do I trick my brain into doing this? Or what are the habits that I should have in order to do this? And that's how I got into this uh, topic. And then it turned out that it's not just about mental models, but also like your health and uh, some protocols you can do to just help you in uh, doing the work you want to do in the best way possible for you. Okay, so what are these habits that helped you during your studying and then later? Uh, yeah, 
So, not postponing everything till the last minute? <laughs> postponing some stuff to the last minute. I mean, yeah. I realized that I mostly postpone stuff because uh, I understand that the solution I'm going to create is not perfect. So if it's not perfect, it doesn't really make sense to start it, right? And then once the deadline approaches, you just realize you have to do it and then perfectionism, perfectionism goes away and then you just do it. So I just learned to work around it, to be honest. I realized that if I'm starting a project and I, I'm not happy about particular things that are challenging things, then I just need to give myself some time to think about it and then accept parts of it that, that are not perfect. And then I feel that I'm unblocked and I can just go on and work on it. So that's kind of my ultimate uh, hack for solving procrastination, for example. Okay, so one thing is having deadlines. So this is doing things uh, almost last minute because it helps you to fight perfectionism. Yeah. And then the other thing is just accepting that it will never be perfect, right? And then exactly. you have to do it. Okay. Um, is there more to that or just these two things? Then, Should we finish our episode now? <laughs> oh, no, no. I mean, that's like genuinely about procrastination, but procrastination is not the only thing, right? That I, I was trying to solve with biohacking. So uh, for me, it's also about how to stay consistent in learning some things that don't have deadline, for example, right? Or if uh, even if there's a deadline, you know, and you need to like focus very intensely on the subject, how do you do it? Like, how can you help yourself to do it? And also uh, going procrastinating and leaving everything to the last minute is very, very stressful and not healthy. So I wanted to understand how can I have a better, healthier lifestyle and actually work from my strength to solve the tasks and do what I love. So that's how, yeah, biohacking and, can help. And how is uh, biohacking different from like usual productivity methods like having deadlines or having a plan or having things like that? I think it's a bit more grounded in science. So, <clears throat> so biohacking, actually just the term, it is a buzzword and it can be explained by, in, like, in so many different ways from genome editing, you know, to simple, like going for a walk or taking a break from the screen every half an hour. So uh, it's really like the definition that you give, you give it is can be very different. So the biohacking that I'm practicing mostly is behavioral. Um, and I don't do like special drugs or medicines, but only vitamins and, and stuff that helps you overall doesn't affect your, let's call it chemical state very much so without chemical interventions and i found that just to speak things. about uh, mushrooms today yeah no, no i'm not talking about that today no <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> i mean there are like really a lot of extreme things that people can do uh so i just want i mean when i started doing it i thought that for me it should be behavioral again so that i can create some habits that can help me and uh, it should be affordable right and it should be something very easy so that the barrier to entry is very low and anybody can, you know, can try it out, see for themselves if it's helpful or not. So that's kind of my approach to biohacking. And uh, yeah, I thought in the beginning, it's also just the productivity tips and tricks and just general knowledge about health uh, and brain. But it turned out that this is part of biohacking. So, uh, and it's very powerful and useful. So that's why, that's how I got into it. So taking a break, going for a walk. Uh, so these are this considered biohacking in your definition i think so for example uh, going for a walk uh, is related to a dopamine production in our system and a dopamine is a hormone that basically drives the effort for us to do something uh, and uh, dopamine is also a hormone that is related to motor movements so when we go for a walk we literally produce dopamine that can later be used uh, or, or help us to like study and learn and work better so it is one of the ways to increase the dopamine in the morning uh, and it has some other great benefits like light consumption uh, so it is a biohacking actually if you do it in the right moments what is this dopamine uh, we actually i think a few interviews ago we spoke with uh, my colleague sadat who was describing his experience of going from individual contributor uh, software engineer to a manager mm -hmm. and then one of the things he mentioned there was that when he was an engineer um, he would all often get this uh, what he referred to as dopamine shots he solves 
a problem, he fixes a bug, then he, had, he gets a shot of dopamine, and then he feels good about this. But when he became a manager, uh, he get like the gratification he was getting was delayed because it's not him who is doing all these things, but somebody else, and it was quite difficult for him. Back then, I didn't really ask him what is dopamine, but now I have a chance to ask you. So what is this and how is it related to what he was talking about? Sure. So first of all, I need to make a disclaimer that I am myself yeah. not a neuroscientist, right? Uh, I just use the general knowledge available, even though I'm trying to be a bit more scientific about my research and conclusions uh, and look for relevant sources. I will try to give you my definition and understanding of, of dopamine. So we have different hormones in our brains that are responsible for different actions we do. And dopamine is a hormone that is produced in our brain on a certain cadence with a certain volume. So it's basically responsible for us doing some stuff. So us reaching a goal, going for a walk, uh, it's responsible for motor movements in our, you know, in our body. Uh, so that's what it does. It's different compared to serotonin, for example, which is the hormone of like happiness and feeling good inside of your body. So if you, I don't know, take a bath, for example, and it's very nice. So you just had some good food, even though food increases dopamine, like the good feeling you have in your stomach gives you serotonin. So it's the a bit opposite of dopamine because dopamine is something you need to do outside of your body to, you know, something from the outside that gives you dopamine. To feel better. Why does fixing a bug give you dopamine? Because you solve a problem. Uh -huh. It requires you to understand the problem, the journey it takes, and then eventually you solve the bug, you solve the problem, your brain celebrates it, gives you more dopamine, and uh, sets you up for fixing more bugs in the future. I mean, okay. if, if you think about it, it's really grounded in like basic things, like you need to walk around as an organism to find some food, right? So if you find sugar, for example, we get a lot of dopamine from having sugar, because sugar was not highly available for our ancestors, right? So that's why our brain currently re rewards us a lot for eating sugar stuff. And it's the same for doing some mental exercises as well, I think. Yeah, interesting. So can you tell us about your journey into biohacking? So during you, your university times, you were procrastinating, putting off things till the last moment, uh, but then you realized maybe it's not the, the best way of doing this. And then at some point you discovered biohacking so how did it happen and what exactly did you discover there what kind of things did you try there and how did they help you sure i would say the first thing that i tried that was very influential for me was meditation and meditation is a very good technique to to stay focused and alert and it helps you to strengthen your prefrontal cortex so you would have a better impulse control what is uh, prefrontal what yeah cortex? It's, a, it's a part of your brain that is located like in front uh, so prefrontal in front, um, and it's related to cognition. Uh, so cognition is what? Cognition is thinking. So all the thinking. high level thinking that you have, like not your primitive brain that wants to eat and sleep, but rather the brain that solves a bug or plans vacations is located. Or talks in... right now, right? So this yeah. is what we use now for communicating. I think so. Yes. Right now in this moment. Yeah. Okay. We have our prefrontal uh, lobe quite act active nowadays it's so. somewhere here right yeah so for those who listen to this not see i'm touching my forehead right now yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah so i started with meditation and that was very good uh, i had a lot of great feelings from it and it was i mean when i talk about meditation i mainly uh, talk about sitting in a chair and breathing and like counting to yourself uh, from one to ten and just feeling your body uh, so this kind of like meditative state and i'm not talking about any like spiritual things because i didn't really practice that uh, so that was one of the things that helped me a lot maybe just wanted to talk a bit about that so did it not feel to you like a waste of time when you tried that like because you're sitting in the chair and you're briefing and counting while you can actually work on things yeah well, the thing is that our, when I think about our bodies, I think that we're not made to function to solve bugs 24-7. You know, we usually have our own cycles in life. Like we obviously go to sleep and then we wake up and we have a certain time when we are the most productive. 
and then our productivity goes lower a little bit. So we need to take breaks. Like there are sleeping cycles of one and a half hours. So we would fall asleep and then we would wake up. And then these cycles continue as we go throughout the day. So you cannot expect that you would be super hyper-focused for three or five hours straight. You need to take breaks. So usually because social media is very addictive, we would take breaks with social media. But meditation is a very good, healthy way to get a break. And uh, it also helps with learning a lot, for example, because um, when we are learning something, our brain changes and it's called neuroplasticity. And the brain change actually happens when we sleep or when we meditate, for example. Uh, it's a protocol called non-sleep deep rest. And okay. this is exactly when the brain is changing. So uh, if you learn something, meditation is also very powerful. How did you open your mind to try meditation I actually you just heard, heard that it's good or yeah i just heard from a lot of people that meditation is good and i followed some you know ceos of some companies on twitter that said hey meditation is very nice you should try it out um and that's how i gave it a shot and mm -hmm. i used the different apps for guided meditation i know there's uh the one that's i use is like open source and it's called medito and it's basically available for free and you can just download and use it uh, there's going to be a person with a nice voice telling you close your eyes relax count from one to ten and stuff like that mm -hmm. yeah. and it usually is like five minutes 15 minutes 20 minutes i did an experiment when i was doing one hour meditation every single day for a month because another very famous investor naval ravikant he suggested to do this uh, it was a very different type of meditation, though, uh, but it was also very helpful. How did you understand that it's helpful? Well, first of all, we it's it's about awareness and being self-aware. So we have so many thoughts and so many things happening with us right now nowadays. Uh, we have complete information overflow. We hear so many things, see so many things. Uh, in Instagram, like you know, in social media, basically, uh, that having a break to just listen to yourself, try to understand how you're feeling, feels like a very big relief. Even though it's uncomforting in the beginning, because it's not something we usually used to. Uh, in my experience, it really felt like a relief. And then you get out of the meditation and you feel relaxed. You feel like you took a break, and now you can go back into doing whatever you you want. They've been doing this for quite some time, right? yeah i think i have like on and off moments so sometimes i'm doing it sometimes i'm not doing it and i think it's also okay because i don't want my productivity system to be like punishing me for not doing something you know i'm trying to listen to myself see like do i have a resource as they call it for it right now or not and if i don't it's also fine um but when i'm studying a lot like nowadays for example i meditate as well because it helps because it's too much right you need to go through like consume a lot of information process a lot of information right so you need to give your mind a break exactly i see and that's oh. yeah you know some cognition happens while we're meditating anyways so the brain cognition is again learning right thinking, or what? thinking. thinking. Okay. yeah it's happening while we meditate as well just in the background we're not aware of it and the brain makes sense of information we learned and updates the neural network Okay. So you tried meditation. What did you try after that? Uh, after meditation, I there were like a lot of topics that I've heard about, but I wasn't sure how scientific they are. So, for example, I was tried... it important for you to for the thing to be scientific? Yeah, more or less, because um, well, I'm a data scientist, and I've always been a fan of scientific methods. You know, uh -huh. so everything we do should be verified. You know, blindly controlled studies or like some good experiments with a scientific base and i wanted to do it not because of a placebo just although placebo is a very powerful tool and this is maybe part of a mental attitude we can talk about but i wanted to know that it actually helps somehow to increase and you know reach your goals so um i tried to find some information about meditation and i saw that it's indeed very very like supported by studies reduces stress helps you to focus better and you learn faster and so on and then I tried cold showers, for example. Uh, yeah, I'm not a big fan of it right now. Uh, it's uh, too but cold now for cold showers. It's a bit too cold, indeed. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, and then 
I also try to have like a proper approach with light, for example, which is not many people know about. So uh, when we wake up, we need to get a lot of light. And then when we go to bed, we should have very little light. And uh, I didn't know about this protocol. And I've heard about it on a podcast. And uh, I've been a big fan ever since. Because when we talk about health and biohacking, like sleep is the foundation of everything. Uh, the, so the podcast I'm talking about is uh, called Huberman Lab Podcast. And there is a professor, uh, Huberman, who talks about light and uh, he's a neuroscientist. And he says that if people would ask him what is the most important factor for productivity and for health across all the domains, he would say it's light. And that kind of makes sense because we live on planet Earth and we have daily cycles. So our bodies, uh, through evolution, adapted to the planet condition and we want to wake up with the sun and go to bed, um, you know, fall asleep when the sun is out. And, so it uh, means during the winter we should go sleep at three o'clock. It's a good one, <laughs> but no. no. Uh, it means we should get try to get more light, uh, uh -huh. as, we, as much light as we can in the morning when we wake up, and uh, just have little light before you go to bed. Mm -hmm. How do you do this? Like just uh, the usual bulbs that we light bulbs that we have in our homes are sufficient for that, or we need to have some fancy setup? Uh, the main principle behind this is that we need to get enough light into the eyes. And it just happens to be that being outside gives you the most light, even if it's cloudy outside. Because the, the glass on the windows, it blocks a lot of light. And um, you can even measure it with your phone. You can download some app to measure the lumen inside the home or and outside. So being outside in the morning is really helpful to get enough light. And this sets you up for the whole day. So it sets your proper cortisol and melatonin cycles, which are like other two hormones that are related <clears throat> to our, how active our body is and how sleepy we are. Um, so just being outside gives you a lot of light. And uh, so that's why it's called behavioral biohacking, right? So because you don't really take any mushrooms, you just know that your body needs light. So you go outside in the morning. Even though in Berlin, sometimes the mornings are really depressive during winter, yeah. you still go out and then it gives you some light, to, enough light to sustain you throughout the day, right? Yeah. And it's about, again, our like evolution development. We needed the light to signal our body that now is the time to go and pick berries or hunt or do the work. And we are biologically the same as we were 100 thousand years ago maybe even two hundred thousand years ago even though our lifestyle changed a lot our biology has not so it in my practice with biohacking i try to replicate a lot of like this natural way of things how our body should function you know in a healthier way and getting enough light in the morning is um, for example good interestingly if you have a candle light in the night it doesn't so i would just say that if you have a lot of light in the night then it messes up with your cycles. And uh, it's proven that like high exposure to light in the in night lowers your dopamine level for next day. So you will not be as motivated to do stuff on the next day. So artificial light are not very good. And if you have some light, it should be behind your eye level, for example. But it's, it's behind your eye level. How, how does it actually? So I'm sitting right here. So this is my eye level, right? So I'm yeah. pointing at my eyes. I need to put something right here, like a small lamp below my eyes. So maybe yeah. near my laptop, right? Where exactly. I so, do something. So at any point of time, if you want to use some light, it should mm -hmm. be below your eye level. Mm -hmm. uh, so so that you would need to look down on it, not up. Mm -hmm. And then it, it should, should be, not be strong. Yeah, it should be very dim. Mm -hmm. And uh, interestingly, the candle or the fire, they don't produce the same effect. Mm -hmm. Because I think our body adapted to candle and fire so far, but not to mm -hmm. the artificial light. So it should be a, a lamp, like LED, LED lamp or like usual light bulb. Yeah, but just not bright one. Mm -hmm. Should it be like white light, yellow light, it doesn't matter? As far as I know, it doesn't really matter. Even though mm -hmm. I've heard about blue light being a bit more like negatively affecting dopamine and the whole cycle. 
But as far as I understand and know, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I think the most, the biggest problem we have is not about the lights and lamps, but it's about phones, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people go to bed with their phones, I mean, myself included, and they would just have high brightness. And that is definitely not good for, for having like a healthy long sleep. Um, so. so do you have any recommendations when we should put away our phone? Like how long before going to bed? Um, I would say if I'm going to bed at like eight or sorry, if I'm going to bed at around 12 or 11, like after eight, I should not have a lot of light. Like mm -hmm. if we try to follow a natural order of things that, you know, the sunset would be around eight o'clock, then maybe after that, we do not want to get a lot of exposure to bright light. What about the phone? Like how... I just decrease lightness on my phone and keep using it, or what do I do with this? Yeah, I usually put it on the minimum brightness. Um, mm -hmm. I think for me, it's like the default level. Sometimes during the day, I just cannot see anything. Yeah, but during the day, it's okay to have a bright light. It's good uh -huh. to have a bright light in the morning. Uh -huh. just, I just think about it like have a lot of light. It's healthy for you. And then as you go closer to the evening, just have less light, and that's fine. There is a question from Lisa. Uh, have you tried out those daylight lamps? Can you recommend any? My apartment is quite dark naturally, and I was wondering about those daylight lamps. Yeah, I didn't. I haven't tried any. What is the daylight lamp? Maybe do you know? Yeah. So as far as I know, it's the lamp that's strong enough and that can imitate uh, natural light pretty well. So mm -hmm. they are using it in Scandinavian countries because you can have time in a year when it's very dark for a long period of time so that's how you could kind of imitate the sun i haven't used it but i only heard good things about it that it really helps i also heard of an alarm clock that actually does not make the sound but rather makes it bright in the room so it's easier mm -hmm. to wake up um, yeah lisa if you can maybe later tell me how it is it would be <laughs> nice. Um, so for waking up, I I don't like this um, alarm that makes sound. I use vibration on my um, bracelet. Is it a good way of waking up or? That I don't know, to be honest. You don't know. I can tell you that light is definitely a good way to wake up. This is how you wake up? Yeah. Okay. And I also try to time my sleep so that I would sleep like seven and a half hours or nine hours. And I've been doing it for years since my high school because we we have like good times to wake up and not so good times to wake up because our sleep goes in cycles. We start with like light sleep and we go into deep sleep. So I would usually just time my sleep and wake up in between the cycles because it's the easiest. So we talked about meditation, we talked about light, and then you said that sleep is the foundation of everything, right? So we also probably need to talk a bit about that. Yeah. And like how it's it looks like you put quite a bit of effort or at least it looks like that to me to plan your sleep you say okay i need to sleep at least this amount of time or this amount of time and it means if i want to wake up at seven o'clock i need to go to bed at this time right yeah that's how we do it more or less yes so okay, can you walk us through the process yeah uh so again i'm not an expert here so when it comes to sleep cycles i would mostly speak from my own experience uh, but I've noticed that, um, well, generally the foundational knowledge is that when we go to bed and we fall asleep, we naturally have a very light sleep so we can easily be waking up. And then we, as the time goes by, uh, we would go into a deep sleep. So our heart rate would be lower. We would have, uh, you know, slower breathing and so on. And, um, um, yeah, and then as we go, we stay in deep sleep and then we go back to like a very light sleep and we have a moment that's called rapid eye movement uh, phase where we have, again, the blood pumps in very quickly, we breathe a lot and we're ready to wake up. And um, this whole cycle from going to light sleep to going to the deep sleep and going back, for me, it takes 90 minutes. But I noticed, for example, that for my partner, it's it's a bit longer. So if it's a 90 minute cycle, that means I can sleep one and a half hours, three hours, four and a half, six, and plus one and a half hours again, seven and a half or nine hours. And I noticed that it's better for me to sleep one cycle less than to sleep a cycle and a little bit more. So for example, if I have, a, um, if I have a, an option to sleep 
eight and a half hours or seven and a half hours, I would rather choose seven and a half because then I would wake up in, the, in between the cycles and I'll feel good. My body would be ready to wake up rather than waking up in the middle of the cycle in a deep sleep and I would feel sleepy the whole day. So that's another kind of little tip, productivity tip I'm using. Do you actually put any effort in planning this or for you it happens naturally now? It's pretty easy to be honest. Like I usually go to bed. It's like too much planning for me. Like I, 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 in the in the evening, I'm tired. I just go to sleep, and then okay, now I need to wake up at seven. So I just put my alarm clock at seven, or eight, or what, uh, like six, whatever time I need to wake up, and that's it. That's it. Otherwise, you need to calculate like okay, uh, now it's like eleven, and I need to wake up at six. Uh, when do I need to wake up to feel good? And then you start calculating all these sleep cycles. And then it's evening, you're tired. I think you, if you really want to give it a shot, calculating seven and a half hours or nine hours is not that difficult. Like, okay. <laughs> you know, it's just like one mental, like, I don't know, less than a minute. And okay, then, so like this is time now. So you want to go to sleep now and then you expect that in 10 minutes you will fall asleep. Right. Then you just take the time now plus 10 minutes and then add seven and a half hours to that time and this is the time you you set up your alarm clock too yeah exactly That's what if right. you wake up during the night oh that happens sometimes uh then <laughs> uh i would again try to just fall asleep maybe meditate a little bit calm down breathe some fresh air um because whenever it's if it's very stressful you know sometimes i could wake up at like five and then it happens and it's okay so mm -hmm. i would just try to go back to sleep Mm -hmm. and, um, but do you go to your alarm clock and adjust it? I think so, yeah. I mean, but how do you know, like, if you will fall asleep now or in half an hour or in one hour? I don't know. I mean, it doesn't <laughs> really happen that often. And if it okay. does, uh, try to minimize the light in the night and maximize the light in the morning because it will set you up for proper sleep in the next few days. And by minimizing the light during the night, you mean do not look at your phone? Because so otherwise, it's, it's probably like dark anyways, because it's night. Yeah, that's good. But, but I mean, like before you go to sleep. Right? Ah, okay. Because usually what I also noticed is that if you have a proper light, let's call it diet, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of light in the morning, very little light in the evening. Um, it would usually only show itself only like one or two days. So it's not an immediate effect. Because it's something that our body needs to be adjusted to. Um, so yeah, if you have like this uh, cases where often that you wake up in the middle of the night just try to have a lot of light in the morning next day little light before going to bed or like almost no light and see for yourself maybe it will improve yeah so speaking about diet but the usual one another question we have is what about changes in your food intake for example do you have any special food that supports your concentration and energy levels oh i'm pretty sure that well, I can share what I've learned about myself so far. So, um, yeah, exercise and nutrition is a very, very important topic as well, because it's proven again and again that it helps with focus and productivity and generally feels good <laughs> to exercise. is a very healthy thing. It improves your cardiovascular disease, your blood circulates better, so you can do everything better. Um, what I am doing in particular is that I try to have enough protein because, um, well, protein is like a building block, uh, amino acids that create muscles and a lot of other important tissues in our body. And um, also protein boosts dopamine as well. So what I try to do is, first of all, I was tracking calories and I was tracking how much protein I was taking every day for almost a year now. Uh, I'm not doing it for the record for the last month or so, but I was doing it before. Uh, and I noticed that having a high protein breakfast helps me to stay productive for the whole day. Oh, can you give us an example of a high protein breakfast? Sure. It's like piece of meat. Well, meat, I don't like to eat meat for breakfast, but I yeah. like to eat cottage cheese. For cottage cheese. Yeah. And then the Greek yogurt is also high in protein. You can have some nuts. You can have eggs for example um i mean soya and stuff like that they also have protein what about cheesecake is it a good breakfast mm -hmm. 
I don't know about that. <laughs> Usually <laughs> that's that is protein too, right? It's it has cottage cheese. Yeah, I mean, I think it's okay. I think uh, you can actually eat whatever you want, and if mm -hmm. you have a goal of weight less, sorry, of weight mm -hmm. loss, mm -hmm. then just make sure you eat less calories than you consume. Mm -hmm. that you need like that your body actually burns and then you would lose weight and mm -hmm. having a cheesecake for breakfast i think is also fine mm -hmm. because it helps with uh, dopamine too not only the protein part but i guess the sugar part contributes more to that yeah that's true but then you will have a lot of i mean this thing about biohacking for me is a lot about dopamine and how to manage it and i would rather try to get dopamine from solving bugs than from eating sugar mm -hmm. So why? Why? Because first of all, I think it's kind of a bug in our system that like it becomes addictive, right? So then you get used to these dopamine shots from eating sugar and then it's easier, right? Exactly. So that's why, you know, getting I mean social networks are so addictive because they also trigger our dopamine. And uh, that's why a lot of people procrastinate and I don't know, watch YouTube videos or spend time in TikTok forever because it's easier way to get dopamine so having moderation in these things actually help you to stay focused on what you really want to do and what you care about what do you think about these protein shakes like are they good oh yeah uh, depends on the shake i guess and uh, i am using one from time to time and it's pretty good so it's like certified and stuff and i'm okay. also a big fan of protein pudding that's like Protein pudding. What is a protein pudding? Protein pudding is a pudding. Uh, with, protein? <laughs> with protein? With <laughs> protein. Yeah, and then it has like low calories but high amount of protein and it's pretty mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. So I eat that, for example, when I see I don't have enough protein for the day. And uh, yeah. it helps me a lot as well. You heard somewhere that eating rice makes you sleepy. Did you ever notice anything like that? Yeah, like... Recently, I just figured out that the biggest killer of my productivity is lunch. <laughs> uh -huh. So I'm actually trying to eat either nothing or very little for lunch. Uh, and then, you know, see, I, I see myself that I can do more and again, study better and just stay a bit more focused so that I can later eat better in the evening. Uh, so if you have like a very, I don't know exactly the specifics and I don't remember it, but if you have a heavy meal, your body needs to process it. Mm -hmm. uh, to transform it into the energy it's not about rice but in general food i think so yeah. so i guess don't eat a lot of food for lunch i mean That's rice <laughs> yeah but rice also is carbohydrates and they <laughs> have sugar so it takes our body resources to transform it and then you know well the, the whole process is a bit complicated but it's basically after you have a lot of sugar stuff you have a sugar drop as well in your blood and that's where you feel like a little bit slow and fatigued and tired mm -hmm. so that could be related to rice mm -hmm. yeah i don't think i ever measured that i just eat rice and then i don't really know if it's rice that contributed to my uh, low energy level or lack of sleep or uh, i don't know lack of sun or whatever yeah okay like, is there maybe it's like um we can talk about these attribution models, right? So how do you actually know that the thing you're doing, the diet that you have, uh, actually contributes to your productivity or if it's something else? Like, how do you know that? That's the science part you mentioned at the beginning, right? You just believe it. Yeah. Well, when it comes to weight loss, for example, I was measuring myself all the time and I was uh, weighting myself every single day. And I was also taking pictures so I could just see if it works or not, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, based on data. When it comes to productivity, it's a little bit harder to, to track it. Uh, I know that some people have the apps that ask you, how are you feeling today? So you can just have logs, you know, of your, you know, you can basically give different ratings for myself, five stars. I feel amazing. I could, you know, mm -hmm. uh, win the whole world or something. And then if you, another day, you would just feel low. I haven't been tracking that in terms of productivity, but I, could, I have, you know, a self-awareness and I can just sometimes see that, you know, I did a lot today and it was a great day and mm -hmm. that's how I track it myself. But so how do you understand what actually contributed to having a good day and doing all the things during the day? Well, I see if I introduced a new habit, for example, if it, uh -huh. uh, like 
last year I had a lot of migraines. So I was also tracking if I, you know, and I had theories why my migraine is happening. So I was uh, having logs every day if I have migraine or not. And if I didn't, so if I did have migraines, I would write down why it might happen. So I noticed mm -hmm. going for walks, for example, and taking a break from my screens helped me to have less migraines. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I, so I don't have a pro ultimate productivity tip how to track your productivity levels, but I think you can just assess it yourself and try mm -hmm. things out. Okay, but the core, like the main point here is, I guess you just need to somehow capture this data, track this data. If you don't, then yeah, you, you don't really know what is helping. That's true. I think that's... Yeah. It's, uh, I guess for data scientists sounds natural, right? Yeah. It's uh, but it's I, not as easy as collecting clicks on the website, right? Yeah, that's true. Like it's when I was doing, yeah, when I was doing weight loss and counting calories, I had to measure everything I eat or like estimate it, and that was a lot of effort. Uh, but you know what? We get used to stuff, and actually, if you have some routines and if you think it's really important for you, uh, tracking it, calculating how much time it takes. It's not really such a big effort. You know, we are doing so much more effort for so many other things. And when mm -hmm. something becomes a habit, you don't really think about it. You just do it. So it's also a power of habits. I'm curious, uh, were there any things that you tried, but you think they didn't help? Uh, yeah. For example, intermittent fasting is mm -hmm. a thing that helps to stay alert. So... If you want to study and you want to learn something, you need to be alert, so fully awake. The intermittent and, fasting means that you do not eat for a couple of days. No, or... it means that you do not. So if you take 24 hours in a day, it means that, let's say, 18 hours, most part of the day you don't eat, and then you only eat within one window of the day. So let's say... Eat once per day, basically. You can eat once per day or twice per day, but only in those four hours or like six mm -hmm. hours or eight hours. So I tried that, for example, and I saw I tried it for two weeks, which I think is long enough. And I just noticed that I have headaches. It just doesn't work for me. Maybe mm -hmm. I should stick to it a bit longer, but I haven't. Maybe I'll give it another shot. But, but if you have headaches, it kind of makes it difficult to stick longer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's why I didn't. <laughs> and I think it's also OK. Um, not everything has to work for you. So, yeah. Have Anything you tried else? any of the stuff I mentioned before? Me? Uh, no, not really. Like, well, I for sure tried cold showers once or maybe twice. I did not like it. <laughs> like, because uh, sometimes you go to LinkedIn and you see posts like, okay, I wake up at 5 a.m. and then the first thing I do is uh, get in a cold shower, then I run, then I spend time with my family and I feel so awesome be like me be awesome too and then okay maybe i should try cold showers too <laughs> i just don't uh, i don't know that, that would be i guess uh it's just too cold mm, other things uh, you also mentioned sleeping like this uh, cycles right i don't think i tried that light definitely not mm -hmm. yeah i don't think i tried anything of what you mentioned okay it's a lot of things to try cool yeah, the thing about, you know, cold showers and some other stuff that's clearly giving you discomfort, I think I, I'm actually a bit biased towards trying such things, you know, and limiting myself. Maybe it's also related to stoicism and this idea of voluntary discomfort, that we have so many things around us nowadays that, you know, you can just eat sugar and sugar and sugar and have dopamine all the time. And it's good to just sometimes, you know, stay away from it to kind of well, scientifically, to reset your dopamine levels and have, have like a weekend without dopamine <laughs> or just to take something that you like about life away from you just to see how it is without without it. Um, and I just personally like Why this. Why would you do this? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I don't know, if you eat, if you like cheese, you just, okay, let's see how life is without cheese. And then... Yeah, you do it for one month and then you realize that life sucks without cheese and you start eating cheese again. I don't know. I have a, I have a, like this, I like the idea that I can actually overcome difficulties in my life. And, and then I, you artificially create them, right? Yeah, sometimes just to test myself. I mean, yeah. I like these different challenges. You know, I had 
a month without sugar last time. Mm -hmm. This month I'm doing a month without carbonated drinks, mm -hmm. uh, for example. So because I like carbonated drinks. So, you know, this kind of stuff, sometimes for me, it's, it's fun. I do it just for fun to test myself. But I imagine that it can be boring mm -hmm. or uh, discomfort. So if I want to see the effect of cold showers, for how long do I need to take them and overcome my resistance to like to overcome my discomfort? As long as you want. <laughs> but if I don't? <laughs> then uh, just don't do it. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah. That's, uh, it's that simple. Yeah. I mean, nobody forces you to do any of this, right? It's just but like... If I want to be productive like these people on LinkedIn. <laughs> I think you should be productive as much as you want yourself to be. So uh -huh. I would set my goal to be somebody else, but just like see yourself and where you want to be and what you want to be like, uh, and then just work towards that. I think that's a bit more healthy and more sustainable way. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, yeah. uh, are there any risks of biohacking? Yeah, I guess. Um, as I said, I'm not willing to try any stuff for example, related to like drugs and medicines that hasn't been tested on humans. Uh, but a lot of people do a lot of self-experimentation. Like I'm not doing that because I think I would rather do something that's safe and feels a bit more natural in the beginning. And then if I see that I want to do even more, then I, you know, I would go for something else. So, I mean, the stuff that I talked about, looking at the sun, you know, in the morning uh, is pretty safe. Measuring how much you sleep is also pretty safe because you should sleep enough more than seven hours or more than eight hours. Um, I mean, eating less sugar is also pretty safe, right? But in eating enough protein, it's also I safe. Know. Depends yeah, how I mean, much sugar you already yes. eat. <laughs> yeah, of course. So uh, I think try to be cautious about what you do and uh, try to find like literature or some credible sources that would tell you if, if it's healthy or not. Consult with your doctor if you. Um, if you're not sure about something, because pe some people have conditions, for example, intermittent fasting doesn't work on some portion, you know, some percentage of people because they have some conditions and it might be even dangerous. So it's a good idea to check with the doctor. If you have doubts. What do you think about coffee and tea? Like, are they helpful for productivity? Yeah. Like, would you consider this biohacking? Having a I cup think of so. coffee in the morning? Yeah. Yes. Uh, coffee helps to increase alertness and remove sleepiness because it blocks the receptor of the hormone I cannot recall right now, but it helps you to be less sleepy basically. Mm. And uh, the only like issue with the caffeine is that it can again reduce sleepiness and you would not fall asleep well, so you, you, it, you would, it would mess up your sleep cycles. And the general recommendation is not to have coffee after like 2 p.m. you know, or maybe after 12. I think Everybody is different in, in how sensitive they are to one thing or another. So when you hear like sleep seven and a half hours, you know, for my girlfriend, it would be actually be eight. And then, you know, I can drink some something with coffee at like 3 p.m. and I'll be fine. But for some other people, it could be, you know, even 4 p.m. or 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think coffee generally is not bad. It's a good stimulant and it can help you. Okay, so we have quite a few questions, so maybe we should go through them. One interesting one is how do you measure productivity? Yeah, as I said, I'm not that good at measuring my productivity. I can just, you know, self-reflect at the end of the day, did I do a lot or not? And um, that's how I do it. I mean, just open a spreadsheet and then for each day, you know, like, did I do a lot? Yes, no? Or Yeah. Like I did little, I did a moderate amount, I did a lot, right? Yeah, I I was um, having like this dashboard for myself in Notion when I would write down all the all the habits that I was trying to learn, um, and I was also tracking like you know if I had a productive day or not. But again, I didn't really stick with that, and I'm pretty sure there are apps that you can use to track your productivity. Uh, I think I would rather just look at my general feeling. Uh, you know, do I feel, did I feel productive or not? Did I have a lot of distractions or not? Could I stick to what I was doing or not? And for me, that's enough. So, mm. so I would answer. Just curious, what were some of these habits uh, in your Notion document that you wanted to try? Well, I can look it up, but <laughs> it was definitely doing sports, uh, mm -hmm. drinking water, 
um, and I think walking a certain number of steps a day because mm -hmm. I would just have I was sitting a lot and mm -hmm. uh, I tried to go for walks more to just move my body so I was checking that so just these simple things and then you would in your notion you would note that okay like I was this day I walked my target level of steps and I felt good or whatever right yeah I got uh -huh. I mean, just, I think also measuring stuff you want to change. Well, obviously it's important. If you can't measure it, you cannot change it. I, I think like measuring it, not necessarily externally somewhere, but just in your brain, you know, did I feel productive is enough for some things. But when it comes to habit tracking, uh, I think this is a really powerful tool. You know, if you can tie your results to some particular things in weight loss, it was tremendous, tremendously helpful for me. I would recommend you to do it. And again, it might seem like it's some work and we might feel lazy about it. But if you think, you know, I really want to do it, I really want to change it, then it doesn't feel like much and you can get used to it pretty quickly. Actually, you mentioned this voluntarily discomfort thing. So if you're okay with creating artificial challenges for yourself then and having fun while doing this, I guess it's also a mind shift, right? Yeah. For sure. Okay. Now I'm taking away sugar. Way. Let's have fun, right? Yeah. Even though life without sugar might be a bit more sad. Yeah. You know, this mental model of like, I'm going to be good and feel good no matter what. And uh, if there is a challenging or like risky thing, and I'm just going to take it as a champ, as I say, or, you know, just trying to have fun with it, it's actually a really powerful tool. It's quite often. Also with the dopamine and with sugar and everything, it's usually our perception of things that matter, but not the exact amount of things that we take or we do. So the perception is really, really strong. That's how our brain really decides if we, I mean, I'm, I'm talking a bit abstract, but I hope you get what I mean. Yeah, it's like staying positive no matter what, if the world is collapsing. And I'm wondering how do you actually make, <laughs> how do you actually do this? <laughs> like it's difficult, like when you see that everything is, uh... How to say, like not everything goes according to plans, and then you know life happens, and then how do you actually uh, perceive things in a positive light? How do you stay? You know, how do you focus on the good things? Yeah, I think th I wouldn't give advice. Stay positive, even when the world is done. <laughs> I don't think it's a good advice. I would just say Maybe that... I misunderstood you, right? Um, it, it was a wrong uh, conclusion. How did you say it? Do you remember? I mean, I would say just be thankful for what you have and build on top of that, you know? Okay. Because uh, there's always going to be some things mm -hmm. really, really big and bad or like small and bad. Mm -hmm. uh, but there also can be good things. So I'm trying to be thankful for what I have and then build from top of it, no matter how bad it is. Okay. That's uh, the stoicism part you mentioned, right? Yeah. Okay. Do you... Can you recommend any book on stoicism, like how to um, do this mindset shift? Yeah, like there's a Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, I believe, who was a Roman emperor and he was a very vivid stoic. Um, and that's pretty cool. Like even though he was an emperor. Isn't it? Huh? Sorry? It's quite an old book, isn't it? Yeah, it's like thousands of years old, but still very relevant, <laughs> surprisingly. So, Interesting. Yeah, I think it was Marcus Aurelius who wrote Meditations. I'm, I'm not sure now. But yeah, Marcus Aurelius and Meditations, because uh, could be and or. <laughs> uh, that's very good. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, another question. How do you manage your time between professional and personal daily life uh, as an engineer? Or I, I don't know if the as an engineer part is important here, but yeah, how do you do this? Um, I try, I want to say I measure it pretty well. I try to make a distinction, you know, like if I need to do some, I try to have some work life balance. But for example, I also want to learn some stuff besides the job. So I think it's important for me to realize how much do I want to do something if I really have a desire to do it. And then if I do, then I will always find time and energy to do it. So yeah. Um, I think yeah it's if if you want to ask how do you, how you should manage your normal life and like work life just have a distinction first and uh, see what you really do what are your priorities like i think 
last year or the year before, I wanted to focus on five things in life and just nothing else, like nothing else would bother me. There are so many topics, you know, that I always wanted to dive in. I could make a list of like 60 of them, but only five of them really mattered. And that was, for example, you know, being with my friends and family more often and talking to them or like going for walks, doing sports, nutrition, and, you know, being productive at work and reaching my goals. So I would only focus on those and not try to do everything at once. And then if you, if you feel blocked that you cannot manage everything, try to find something that you can manage, manage and just build from it. And uh, at the beginning of this interview, we talked about uh, perfectionism. So, and then you said at the beginning that you managed to overcome it, to accept the, that it's okay to be not perfect. And the question we have is, how did you change your mindset to overcome perfection? Uh, because it's super hard for me. Yeah. So I would say that perfectionism <laughs> comes from, to, to overcome it, you need to understand two things and really accept them. First, that accept that nobody is perfect and accept that you are not perfect and that it's okay. So accept yourself as you are and accept others as they are and see your own path in life. Yeah. Sounds simple, but I guess it's more, there, there is more to that than just, okay, now I accept and now my life is different, right? So how do you actually accept it? Is it was, like the meditation part that you mentioned at the beginning? No, I mean, I think it took a psychologist to work with me in order to, <clears throat> for me to accept these things and understand them deeply. Uh, one exercise I, did, exercise I did that really helped me, I think, is uh, looking at my past self and my future self and talking to myself, you know? What is the advice you would give to your five-year-old, for you being five-year-old or like for you being 15-year-old or 30 or 45 or 50 and so on? You know, how would you talk to yourself? Like if you would look at your old pictures, you know, would you tell that, hey, you are not perfect. You did this painting, but it's not perfect. No, you just really accept yourself when you're young and, you know, you have kindness and love in your heart. So I think if you try to do this exercise, look at your old pictures, um, it's really, really powerful and definitely changed a lot for me. And uh, yeah. Okay. Um, then another question is, I was going to ask this question anyways, but since it's coming from, uh, so which book would you recommend to learn more about biohacking? Anything special for data scientists or ML engineers by any chance? Yeah, um, I would recommend not a book, but a podcast. And it's called Huberman Lab Podcast by Andrew Huberman. It has a lot of episodes about pretty much everything uh, or a lot of things related to, you know, healthy work of mind and body and hormones and what are the behaviors and protocols you want to do. I'm a big fan and most of the stuff I learned was from him, even though I also were reading some other books. So if I would just recommend one thing, it would be this for sure. Mm -hmm. okay please give us a link but it's huberman lab right yeah huberman lab and okay. uh, i mean i as a data scientist was mostly interested in learning in the beginning how do i accelerate my learning and so on what is what does the science know about learning and all of the other things so that's how i started watching the episodes and uh, fell in love with the whole topic and then extended it to more areas you know like body and stuff Maybe can you also send us the list of your, I don't know, top three or top two, or I don't know, the single most um, favorite one episode? Yeah, sure. I have them in mind already, so I'll do it. Okay, good. So we will include that in the show notes. Yeah. Um, I think that's all we have time for today. We actually wanted to cover a lot more. That was uh, quite ambitious, but... Uh, yeah, that was fun. So thanks uh, a lot for joining us today. Thanks for sharing all these tips and talking about your story. Um, yeah, I have a lot of notes. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure. And I really hope that even though some of these things are obvious, actually can help someone to have a better life. Uh, that would make me happy. I'll need to think how I can have more daylight in the morning. That's a... Uh, key takeaway, I guess, for me. Okay. <laughs>
Okay. Yeah. Thanks for this discussion. Thanks everyone for joining us today. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Have a great day, everyone.